The word of the day uh, is rheumatoid because we have our speaker today uh, doing uh, rheumatology for the allergist. And actually, as I looked at his presentation, and I've been working with the fellows on board review, this is clearly board review material to know the, the basic immunology of, um, of all of these immunologic systems. I hope everybody had a good new year. I was away for a couple of weeks in Hawaii, so I can't complain. Oh, that's <laughs> too bad. I'm not supposed to make political remarks, but I always do. And I'll try and be subtle about this one. Yeah. I just said, Happy New Year, a good new year. I don't actually think the world is off to a good new year. The only good thing that I see that's happened is the Seahawks won. Otherwise, the world seems to be on fire. Right? Um, all right, so uh, Marat, um, I, I don't attempt to pronounce his. Okay, you mean outside people? Yeah. You hear, you hear yeah. noise that I. Okay, so those on the outside, uh, mute your uh, microphone so we don't get feedback. Um, so we're going to have laboratory testing in rheumatology today. Welcome, thank you for the introduction. I work uh, at the VA uh, and, and split my time between American Lake VA and Seattle VA. And that's what basically we're doing in rheumatology. Uh, and uh, lab testing is an essential part of that. Uh, and uh, I'll just describe the tests which are frequently used by rheumatologists so you have an idea. What those uh, uh, tests are, uh, they, uh, they are intended to detect and measure, and uh, we'll just try to interpret them uh, in different clinical contexts. So, first of all, in rheumatology, we do try to detect inflammation. When people come, we, we just need to know if they are inflamed or not. And uh, obviously, the acute phase reactants, uh, those are produced in response to infection, malignancy, tissue injury, or rheumatic disease. And as you can see, rheumatic disease is only one of the reasons to people, uh, for people to have elevated uh, acute phase reactants. And what are acute phase reactants? Uh, those are mainly uh, proteins which are produced in the liver in response to inflammation. And those are fibrinogen, haptoglobin, C-reactive protein, serum amyloid A, ferritin, alpha-1 antitrypsin, and some other proteins. And each of those you can actually measure. And fibrinogen would be, be a very good acute phase reaction to measure. Uh, along with CRP or heptoglobin. So those are all reasonable choices when you actually want to measure inflammation. And as I already mentioned, acute phase reactants are produced in the liver. And uh, they are produced in response to IL-6, which is an important mediate, mediator of inflammation that <coughs> stimulates the action of other mediators. And it is produced in monocytes and macrophages. And actually, we do use IL-6 uh, blockers to in rheumatology like tocilizumab. But, um, so we'll just get to ESR. Uh, so, uh, so the the idea. Uh, with ESR is that normally red blood cells, normal red blood cells, they are, uh, their outside membranes are negatively charged and they, they tend not to clump because, you know. But when this negative charge goes away because of the acute phase reactants, so they change the charge because they, they attach to the red blood cells and they change the charge in red blood cells and this negative charge eliminated and they're becoming, so to speak, neutral 
to each other, they tend to aggregate more. And uh, essentially, erythrocyte sedimentation rate is uh, a distance that red blood cells form within a specified tube over an hour, so late stack. And uh, not many labs are doing that now. In, in uh, Where I was trained in rheumatology, we did have rheumatology lab, and people were doing like this uh, Western Green ESR uh, normally. It's, it just takes time. Um, and it's, it's an indirect measurement of inflammation. Are any one of the specific acute phase reactants or responsible for the aggregation, or is it a collective effect of all of them? Probably fibrinogen. Probably fibrinogen. My mentor 40 years ago mm -hmm. taught me you either needed a sed rate or a good doctor, but not both. <laughs> <laughs> so, in approximately two thirds, uh, in two thirds of the labs, uh, uh, ESR is measured uh, based in Western grain based methods like vacuum tubes, and those are automated measurements with uh, using uh, infrared light. And results are available in 30 minutes. And those are relatively good tests. There are other tests which are based on uh, centrifugation and uh, photometric methods. And then the uh, find it on the curve what, 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 what's the ESR like according to those calibrations. And uh, those results are usually available in five minutes, so they are relatively fast. Um, are those good? Well, really, those methods, they, they really do not estimate the amount of fibrinogen and other things that may affect ESR. And that's why, although those are acceptable, but not, I would say if I have to choose, I would just use less based method. And you can always estimate ESR. Uh, without even looking at the normal range. And the normal estimation is, for males, it's very easy. It's H divided by 2. And for females, it's H plus 10 divided by 2. So, uh, and again, ESR does not really mean inflammation all the time, uh, because there are conditions when the fibrinogen levels are increased, and those are pregnancy, diabetes, end-stage renal disease, and heart disease. They will all cause some uh, really mild to moderate elevation of ESR. Uh, so female gender, aging, anemia, obesity, and gammopathy, they may actually be associated with gammopathy for sure, it could be associated with a significant ESR. So the ranges could be from mild elevation to, to severe, but gammopathies uh, are, they tend to elevate them significantly. And so significantly, when, when you get significantly elevated ESR, uh, you have to think uh, what's What's most dangerous? And, and actually, bacterial infection, which is the most dangerous setting, would be actually the most frequent setting in, uh, in somebody who has ESR more than 100. So, people don't do. Okay, I'm going to do this so I don't disrupt you guys. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> that was not a question. So, uh, Somebody's not muted. No. We hear your conversation. Uh, so, bacterial infection. So recently, we uh, approximately a month ago, we, we had an inpatient consult 
when the patient was presumed to have PMR, polymyalgia rheumatica. It's one of the inflammatory conditions which are, which is treated with the prednisone. Just because of the, you know, aches and pains and not feeling well and, uh, and elevated ESR. And he was not doing well, started on prednisone. <coughs> ESR was significantly elevated. So one of the things that, you know, were done first were blood cultures and they turned out to be positive for STAM. So prednisone was stopped and uh, antibiotics were started. Actually, rheumatology were the ones who insisted on blood cultures in that patient. So, but that's, that's the thing, just rule out the most frequent and the most dangerous thing. Then connective tissue disease, when you see something like high sed rate, really high, because more than 100 millimeters per hour is really high, you have to think about a significant amount of inflammation in the blood, in the blood vessels, in the blood system. And significant is, is a key word here. Giant cell arteritis will give you a significant amount of inflammation. Lupus vasculitis will give you a significant amount of inflammation. Like any type of systemic vasculitis would be a significant amount of inflammation. And that could give very significant surgery. Malignancy, like lymphomas and myelomas, uh, they, they can give very high ESRs just because they produce lots of immune globulins. And then uh, could be other causes. So bacterial connective tissue disease, malignancy. You, you, you have to think about those. And what, what happens when somebody comes in and, uh, you know, the reason is not very clear. And we get that a lot as rheumatologists, you know, to explain elevated sed rates in somebody who has very vague symptoms. And we usually go through physical exam, look at CBCs, anything that could point to a possible culprit here, including infection, some sort of tissue injury. And uh, what, what happens most of the time, we, 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 we look for previous said rates. We do recheck ESR just to make sure that this is not a lab error, along with CRP. And this is the key. You, you have to add something else to, to see if this is an isolated phenomenon or not. And most of the time, we do recheck said rates, and they, they will become normal in 8 out of 10 people in, in a certain amount of time. So why do we order CRP along with ESR? Well, gammopathy. Is, uh, is one of the causes of without significant amount of inflammation with normal C-reactive proteins. And uh, that's, uh, in that case, if somebody has consistently high set rates, normal C-reactive proteins, it's probably time to check for SPF UPEP. Serum protein electrophoresis, urine protein electrophoresis. But there are situations when set rate is, is not high, actually it's zero. And, I, and I, uh, I saw patients like that. And there are certain conditions that, that cause that. So for example, polycytemia, yeah. uh, microcytosis. So, Polycytemia, microcytosis, spherocytosis, sickle cell. As you can see, the number, the size, and the shape of red blood cells really defines the sed rate. And a significant amount of spherocytosis could decrease sed rate. Or when there is no or low or defective fibrinogen. Somebody is immune deficient, 
with low immunoglobulins and the increased plasma viscosity that build increased set rate or decreased yeah, decreased. I'm just curious, I was going to ask the fellows when you're in the immunology clinic and you're seeing people who are at gamma globulin, did you run a set rate? Anybody use that? Is it not ready? Not ready. Really. Are you going to after today? <laughs> I think if there's a concern, yeah. Okay. I just, which, just, which doesn't change our management. <laughs> so, you know, another test that's of interest that we use a lot is. We, is C-reactive protein. It's an acute phase reactant by itself. So it's more, I would say, direct, direct measurement of inflammation. Uh, and its exact function is unknown. It's produced by the liver in response to cytokines or IL-6. Uh, so works by attaching to phospholipids and some histones. Elevation starts within four hours of an inciting event. So it, it really an early starter. And, and usually the highest level could be achieved within the window of 24 to 72 hours. And uh, you measure, it. there are two scales uh, 0.5 to 1 and 5 to 10. I mean, different labs give you two different ranges, but there you, you can see that. Uh, so, after th when, when you, again, like with ESR, when it's significantly elevated, and, and, and you would see what's significantly elevated when, when it's 10 times uh, of the upper limit of normal, then you have to think again in the, in the same uh, direction. Bacterial infection, systemic vasculitis, acute crystalline arthritis, like gout flares, especially if major joints are involved, could be very, 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 very inflammatory like gout or pseudogout flares, and we see that all the time. Those give you really high C-reactive proteins. <clears throat> it's widely metastatic cancer. Those are associated with elevated CRP. So pretty much the same. So what's the difference between SED rate and C-reactive protein? Before you go on, you have the range of... 8 to 10, and then you have in parentheses 80 to 100, but it looks like it's the same. Yes, it's, it's, it's the same. It's like different labs. For example, if, if we go to here, so normal levels are 0.5 to 1 milligram per deciliter, right? Or 5 to 10 milligrams per deciliter. Different labs give you different labs. For example, like at the VA, we have 0.5 to 1 milligrams uh, per deciliter. This is the normal range. A different technology gives you the different answer? I don't know. I, I really don't know that. It just, I think it's, it's essentially what they're measuring is the same, the same pandemic, but probably using different concentration of, you know, probably 10 times of what they use. I, I mean, that would be my guess. But I don't know the exact how, how it's done exactly. What I do know, though, is that when you get really high CRPs, it's like eight to 10 times of, of the upper limit of normal. Not very frequently, but you know, there are, there are other patients which, which, which would have that, and that's serious. So you have to really look for a systemic reason. So, some people prefer to use SED rate and CRP together. And when CRP, and the reason for that is because they, they have different you know, time ranges, I would say. So, 
CLP rises and falls more quickly within hours. And that could be very helpful when you want to see a response to anti-inflammatory therapy. That helps. Uh, ESR really rises slowly and it does slowly fall. For example, if the inflammation is over, only uh, uh, during the first week when the, really there is no inflammation, the ESR falls only by 50%. So it may take some weeks to fall. For example, somebody who just recently had a viral infection a week ago, and they come to your clinic to be, re to be evaluated for the activity of their rheumatoid arthritis. If you want to depend on SED rate, it's, it's going to be elevated. So just, you just have to keep those in mind whenever you check, whenever you, you order a marker of inflammation, you just have to keep that in mind. So, probably not to order it when there is a tiny and small possibility of any infection. So CRP in that, uh, in that setting becomes really helpful. Again, if somebody has hypergammaglobulinemia and uh, you, you need to use a, a marker of inflammation, it would be CRP in that regard, because SED rate will stay elevated. <clears throat> okay, so uh, serum protein electrophoresis. This is another, actually, measurement of inflammation, another good test for inflammation. As, uh, I, I tried to make this table really, really simple because uh, on SPEP you see protein fractions, alpha-1, alpha-2, beta, gamma, and albumin. And so alpha-1 is mainly, those are inflammatory proteins like uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin. Alpha-2, the alpha-2 macroglobulin, haptoglobin. Uh, Beta is mostly the, 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 the this fraction is transferring, and uh, the when when there is a, the area between beta and gamma is uh, fibrinogen and CRP, and uh, so then albumin obviously and uh, and gamma uh, globulins are obvious. And, and the numbers are very easy, actually, to remember. Alpha-1 is 5%, alpha-2 is 10%, beta is 15%, gamma is 20%. So albumin is the most predominant, 50% of the proteins in the serum. Uh, and then you can see what fractions go up. So acute phase reactants and the negative acute phase reactants. And so, as you can see, alpha-1, alpha-2, they all go up, so percent, uh, percentage-wise. Beta transferring goes down, so it's a negative uh, marker of inflammation. But the, the beta-gamma area, the area between beta and gamma, it actually goes up because of fibrinogen and C-reactive protein. And then, of course, immune globulins go up and albumin goes down. So pretty much everything goes up except for albumin, which goes down uh, percentage-wise. So that's, and, and SPEP is, is very sensitive because it gives you multiple uh, markers of inflammation. That's why it's it's it, 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 it's so 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 helpful. Most people would not even think about SDEP in the sense that this could be really a good measurement of, or detection of inflammation. Actually, it is. So before I go to ANAs, I uh, just wanted to say that. ESR, CRP, 
as that those are not the only things that could be measured. So, for example, I, for polymyalgia aromatic, I really like fibrinogen because it's very consistently elevated in those patients, like in many other inflammatory conditions. It's just a matter of, you know, what, what you're used to. When I was a medical student, I remember <coughs> that, that were checked were zero mucoid, like in, in the lab, but that was back in Russia. Uh, so, but things which are really not routinely measured now. So. And, uh, but now it's mostly SED rate, C-reactive protein, s -bet. So, ANAs, anti-nuclear antibodies now, we, we get a lot of consults like, to explain in a positive anti-nuclear antibodies ordered by uh, other providers. And there are, and, and there are two uh, types of those tests. And the gold standard is in indirect immunofluorescence, it's or also called uh, fluorescent ANA. It's a gold gold standard. It's a it's a good test, essentially. And uh, there are, uh, there is ELISA, which is a uh, uh, which let's say it's a it's a much less reliable test. And so I'll just I'll just say those things about ELISA, and I'll not touch it again. Uh, so it does check for eight to ten nuclear antigens. <coughs> it is less sensitive than uh, uh, fluorescent test. It frequently, though, <coughs> despite being less sensitive, it frequently gives you false positive results because the test systems uh, could, you know, and the antigens that are used there sometimes, you know, they change their structure. And, you know, all of a sudden, you get false positive results. And it, it is cheaper compared to, uh, it's much less elaborate test, and it's cheaper compared to uh, 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 fluorescent uh, ANA testing. <clears throat> so fluorescent ANA testing is... Very basic, but at the same time, it's very, uh, it's very, uh, uh, it's a very good test. So, this human uh, epithelial uh, tumor cells are the cells which are used in this test test. And the reason why they are used because this is a constantly proliferating. Uh, 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 constantly proliferating uh, clone of cells, which has lots of antigens, and uh, and the permeability is good of those cells. So how it's done? So the patient serum added to those cells, and then the ANA uh, binds to nuclear antigens, and then washing is involved. And then the addition of immunoglobulin <clears throat> to antibody. So basically, and this is a label immunoglobulin. So already those antibodies which are there on those cells, and those <coughs> antibodies are coming from patient's uh, serum, you, you, you treat this, the whole test system with uh, fluorescent antibodies against antibody. And then, then uh, the uh, certain patterns are discovered uh, on microscopy. This test is reported in titers, and it's because the patient's serum is diluted, and the great, greatest titer is uh, reported. And the, the, the higher the titer, the more significant is the task. The greatest titer before you extinguish a positive yes, result. Yes, before you extinguish the positive <clears throat> result. So, for example, and, and we'll talk about that. Just one question on the ELISA. 
Mm -hmm. and occasionally, you'll see a result not expressed as tighter, but in nope. a different. Is that the ELISA method that's being expressed? Yes, different that, that's exactly that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly that. So, in what I really like this is just because it's much more sensitive and it really against it is against if it's positive it, it covers more antigens too so positive test uh, it's uh, for for this test or for many other tests to be considered positive it it should exceed the level seen in 95% of the population. And usually with HEP2 cells based assay, it's positive at 1 to 160 titer. And again, very frequently you get positive results in normal individuals. So for instance, if you have ANA titer of 1 to 40, up to up to thirty percent of normal individuals could get that, and and if a person is 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 an elderly, then up to seventy percent. And again, one to forty is basically it's not even a borderline; it's very low. Tighter. Now, one to eighty in ten to fifteen percent, still very significant. <clears throat> 1 to 165% and 1 to 323%. Do I see people who do not have any clinical disease uh, with the titers of 1 to 320? Very frequently. They, they get referred to as for. But again, if you, if you, if you check general population, it will be 5% and 3%, which is a significant number anyway. If you check anybody in this country, there will be some millions of people who would get this positive at a significant titer. What does it mean? Well, it means that it doesn't mean a disease, but the, it may be it may be that somebody who has really high titers maybe developing something or just had some, some situation where they had an infection and change <clears throat> in ANAs. The best way to, to deal with that in, in somebody who doesn't have symptoms and if they are worried about that, only if they are worried about this, just to recheck it sometime later. But most of the time, if people don't have any clinical disease, we tend not to recheck it. So why to use? Well, it's very sensitive test for lupus. Most people with lupus, 99 to 100% would have it positive. In the past, there was a even you know, concern. Does any negative lupus exist? Well, sort of, because sometimes there are test systems which report as result is ANA negative, but in the same time, it's positive, but the antigen was not really detected by the test system. And that happens sometimes. When, when, when instead of HEP2 cell lines, uh, like uh, animal-based tissue lines are used because they, are, they, they have less antigen representation. Drug-induced lupus, 100%. Mixed connective tissue disease, 100%. Autoimmune hepatitis, 100%. So you have to have positive ANAs for that. For those, systemic sclerosis could be as high as 95%. Autoimmune thyroid disease. This is a very good explanation for many positive ANAs. Hashimoto's or uh, race disease, you know, that happens frequently. What's the definition of positive then? Is it 160? So, 
this test system will, will actually give you, like when, when you get the report, some, some actually report it positive as to 1 to 80. I wouldn't treat those seriously, though. I would, I would be more serious when it starts to be 1 to 160, regardless of what the test system says. It's just, uh, it's just sheer numbers of the likelihood. But if somebody has suggestive symptoms at the title of 1 to 80, I would be concerned. So, Call from potential. Somebody mute their phone, please. Call from potential. Uh, uh, I just asked a sort of related question. Patients that clearly have autoimmune thyroid disease and they have positives, do they tend to be lower titers? In other words, because obviously those patients tend to have more autoimmunity also. <coughs> It's most of the time, yeah. most of the time, they, they, they tend to have, they have to have lower titers. Like, for example, if somebody has lupus nephritis, they tend to have high, high titers. Mm -hmm. Are you going to talk about the split outs where they do the reflex ANAs and they'll give you the anti double stranded DNA and anti SCL, or you just don't use those? We do. But I, since this is a talk for like allergists, and, and usually we, 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 we we can in, 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 interpret those, but I just wanted to talk about ANA by itself. I, I can mention, but that was not my intention, actually. What, will a common viral illness bump your into your ANA? It may. It may. Yeah. So, for ANAs, I just I just wanted you to know that measure it in the right check it in the right clinical context because it's a good screening test for lupus, you know, sort of because you know in the right for example if the pretest probability is high, you have to check it. But is it a good screening test in general population? No. And the reason for that is because, let's say you check everybody for ANA, and there will be still much more people who have positive ANA than people with lupus. Like, Really, and the, the difference will be significant. So you would not achieve anything by just using it as a screening test. Uh, because as you saw, 3% of the population is some million people, you know, some millions. So like, <coughs> how about if you change the denominator to CIU patients? chronic idiopathic urea. Do you think it's useful there? Or good question. <laughs> chronic. <laughs> yeah. I run it all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do too. No. Well, you, you mean uh, a &E? Yes. Well, the thing is, again, in the right clinical context, and when a specialist thinks that, you know, it's it's a significant and you know appropriate clinical context that's that's very appropriate for example recently i had to accept so i was triaging consults well at the va we do triage <coughs> consults and there was a consult from an allergist and the patient had uh angioedema and the ana was checked and the ana titer was uh, 1 to 1280 significant titer was was the practitioner really doing a good job uh, obtaining ANA? Yes, absolutely. Patient had photosensitivity at some point in life. They had re nods, and they had angioedema, and you know their ANA was checked. It's a very appropriate clinical context, and. Uh, 
follow-up question. Um, mm -hmm. In this context, should we just be checking A and A without the reflex? Because I think in here, when I order the default order is A and A with reflex to... Um, I think, I don't see anything bad about A and A with reflex. And most of the time, what the labs would do, they would run two tests. They would just run uh, uh, fluorescent A and A, which is the most important, and they would run as a reflex test, they would run ELISA. And what actually happens, the fluorescent <coughs> ANA is negative, which is a much more superior test most of the time. And ELISA comes back positive with a positive reflex. You know, like low positive reflex. I mean, if, if patients do not have any suggestive symptoms, I wouldn't even repeat that test. But I would just... You know, explain that this pulls positive. Do you think it would be better to change the variable and get rid of the low 1 to 40 and maybe not report it as positive till 1 to 80 or 1 to 160? And in some labs, do that. Some labs actually say they, their cutoff is 1 to 80. It just it, it, it's just a matter of you know some some labs are really good and very confident that you know their 1 to 80 or their 1 to 40 is a true cut off. Frankly, when, when, when you really look at those, again, in somebody who has no clinical presentation, but the lab was checked for some reason, I would be much more comfortable with higher titers. As you can see, there are people with that. Mm. But in somebody who, whose titer is very low, like 1 to 40, 1 to 80, I would be very comfortable saying that they do not have clinical disease if they don't have it. And I wouldn't do any further tests on that. What, what um, titer do labs generally use to decide they're going to do a reflex panel? Any positives? Will they, they do it at 1 to 40? Well, most of the time, they do reflex panel on a lysis. So what they do, if, some, if, if this comes positive, so what, what actually happens, they do this. They run two sets of labs. They run both fluorescent ANA and a lysis. And fluorescent ANA takes more time than a lysis. Lysis could be reported relatively quickly. And they already they have already done reflex ANAs on ELISA if it comes back positive, and fluorescent ANA is still running, and then a day later you will get a fluorescent ANA, and if it's positive, well, that's what I'm asking. What do they call positive to give you then the reflex result? Oh, positive on ELISA. For example, any antigen oh, yeah. positive on ELISA. They would just do reflex on the laser. Some labs, some some you can, for example, at the VA, we order two sets of labs of labs with one click. Some other institutions work differently. You can order fluorescent, and when it becomes positive, they do a reflex. So it's just it's just a matter of you know, lab culture in an institution. I would prefer to get everything and then just think what to do with that. That would be my <laughs> preference. <laughs> so I don't so I don't have to come back to that. Uh, so you know, just to get everything in hand. So it's not overall a good screening test for lupus or autoimmune conditions. So use it in the right setting. You know. Okay, now complements. Allergists, new allergologists, they do much more about complement than I do. I just know like, <coughs> my part, what, what we use it for. Decrease in complements uh, could be either deficiency or or consumption with immune complexes. And the latter one is the most important one for a rheumatologist. So 
consumption. And that's what basically we'll concentrate on. So there are many diseases which are associated with decrease in components of complement, especially because of the immunocomplex consumption. And rheumatic diseases like lupus, many types of systemic vasculitis, immune complex mediated. Severe rheumatoid factor positive rheumatoid arthritis because it does cause systemic inflammation resembling systemic vasculitis because it's an immune complex disease. So those will cause decreased components of complement. Infections, bacteria, sepsis, bacterial infections like pneumococcal sepsis, like those things will cause complement consumption of complement. Uh, viremias. Some forms of glomerulonephritis, like classically post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, not all forms of glomerulonephritis would be a low complement state. Some would be complements would be normal. For example, post-immune glomerulonephritis would not really decrease significantly uh, uh, complements. So some will, some will not. And a good really test for that is you have to ask yourself. Are immune complexes involved? That could affect the, uh, the complement level. That, that, that can affect the complement levels. So what do we order? Uh, if we are thinking about immune complex mediated complement consumption and which activates classic pathway, that would give you low C3 and C4. So I usually order both. And then if alternative pathway is involved, then it causes more low C3 and relatively normal C4. And normal C3 and low C4, it's either low level of activation uh, of complement or uh, Red for deficiency, heterozygosity uh, of C4. And that, I don't know much about, but basically what I'm trying to detect is is there a complement consumption by immune complexes or not? Another good test is CH50, but you require all nine components of complement to be intact and operational in order for this test to work. And uh, what you actually get, you get red blood cells, sheep red blood cells, with, which are sensitized uh, with rabbit IgMs. And you add human serum. and. Uh, if all the components of complement are present in human serum, then membrane attack complex is formed and there is hemolysis. Uh, it's a good screening test for complement deficiency since it checks for everything, essentially. Do you have any idea that it seems the most illogical test you could ever work out, a rabbit component, a sheep component, and a human component? Well, How that test ever got developed? Uh, again, I don't know much about that, but in the same time, you know, sheep's uh, red blood cells have been used for a long time in many lab tests, you know, in, 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 in many complement essentially tests and other tests, so historically, but just uh, probably in that era, you know, really what they did, they the injected rabbits with, you know, red blood cells. So rabbits developed IgMs, which were extracted. So and then, so and and and, and the thing is that it's just a ready test system. You just add something else like human serum, and basically, if the components of complement are present, all of them then the the, the, the hemolysis uh, occurs. Well, yeah. So, anyway. OK. 
okay, so let's say you know that you're dealing with immune complex disease, and yet you check complement levels, and those are not low. What does that mean? Does that happen? And it really does, because if you if you think of components of complement, those are uh, proteins which increase with inflammation. And if the levels of immune complex mediated inflammation is are relatively low, your components of complement may be not low, like C3 and C4. So just what what would be uh, what, what, what would you do next? Well, you can check them later if you, if you want to, or just be at peace with them not being very low. So, but it's sometimes people use it as an argument. Well, complement levels are not low. They could not, sometimes they're not low in significantly immunocomplex you know, uh, mediated conditions, which immune complexes in which are really significantly implicated. We see that all the time. So just if it's not there, it doesn't mean that the process is not there. So you have to interpret with caution those. Now, rheumatoid factor. Rheumatoid factor, yeah, it will be really fast from here. Everybody orders rheumatoid factor. Everybody orders rheumatoid factor. People, people just love it. They, 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 they like to order it, and then they, they get it positive. And then, and then they have to explain it somehow. So first of all, what is rheumatoid factor? Well, it's, it's a vehicle so to remove something from the system. And Everybody has rheumatoid factors, like some, some, some levels of rheumatoid factors. And those are antibodies, IgMs, IgGs, IgEs, so different, uh, different type antibodies to other antibodies. In, in, in some of the, you know, uh, in some of the textbooks, you'll find that rheumatoid factor is IgM, yes. Rheumatoid factor is IgM, just because it's used for the test. So we, we actually measure IgM's rheumatoid factors. But it doesn't mean that rheumatoid factor is always IgM. It's like different antibodies. We just measure IgM. That's true. So it's, it's a vehicle to remove immune complexes from circulation. And that is why you get many inflammatory conditions with elevated rheumatoid factor levels. So it's clinically, classically measured in rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, there is an entity which is known as rheumatoid factor positive rheumatoid arthritis. And it could be up to 60 to 80% and in the right clinical setting, for example, if this is an erosive significant rheumatoid arthritis with positive rheumatoid factor, it's a very specific test, very specific, in the right clinical setting. But there are many rheumatoid uh, arthritis cases without positive rheumatoid factor. So, can it be positive in healthy people? Yes. It can be, but usually low levels uh, of positivity. For example, in, 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 in this positivity, actually, the rates of it increases with age. So uh, 20 to 60 years old, up to 4% of the population could be a rheumatoid factor positive, 60 to 75%. 70 and older, 10 to 25 percent. But we're talking about lower levels. So, 
causes of positive rheumatoid factor, lupus, mixed connective tissue disease, systemic sclerosis, surgeon syndrome, sarcoid, rheumatoid or rheumatic autoimmune diseases. Primary biliary cholangitis, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, so neoplasms in cryoglobular anemias, if you remember from a year ago, we were talking about that, that type 2 and type 3 cryoglobular anemias, which are immune complex diseases, uh, those are with positive rheumatoid factor and infections. So, you know, it's not only rheumatoid arthritis, but hepatitis C, hepatitis B, HIV disease, which uh, causes polyclonal gammopathy. Those are all. Uh, those are all with rheumatoid factor. Actually, positive rheumatoid factor is one of the minor Duke's criteria for endocarditis. So you know, that's why y you have to know what rheumatoid factor does. Why is it why it is elevated in the first place, and then you will be able to pretty much see which diseases on the list can cause elevated rheumatoid factor. Uh, it's just it it comes from from what it does. Okay, uh, just. Very briefly, anti-citrulinated protein antibodies, those are antibodies which we uh, use for rheumatoid arthritis. Those are antibodies against citrulline residues. There are many commercially available assays. Now, it's really specific for rheumatoid arthritis. Sensitivity is like rheumatoid arthritis, but specificity is much better. Ha High levels of positive C and CCP <coughs> antibodies, they're pretty specific for rheumatoid arthritis. The patient either has rheumatoid arthritis or may have it in the future. That's, that's yeah, that was shown. Uh, why to know it for, like, not a rheumatologist? Well, for example, if somebody has hepatitis C, it's a condition that is known to cause positive rheumatoid factor. And uh, hepatitis C patients have lots of arthralgias. They may have rheumatoid-like disease, rheumatoid arthritis-like disease. And I usually check CCP on those, like in, on anybody with suspected rheumatoid arthritis, but on those, those patients would be of particular interest because if they do have positive CCP, the odds are that they have true rheumatoid arthritis, not hepatitis C-associated arthropathy. And, of course, CCP, anti-CCP antibodies mean more severe rheumatoid arthritis. So, take-home points. Uh, so you have to interpret the order, actually, lab tests in the context, context of disease. If the pretest probability, pre probability is high, you know, could be ordered. Set rate, CRP, SPAP, you are, you, you are very well equipped to, to detect inflammation. Know that elevated ESR is not always inflammation doesn't mean always inflammation, like gammopathies, you know. All the time in rheumatology clinic, you would get a patient whose ESR is very high and CRP is normal. <coughs> actually go for a long time. So for a long time to, 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 to a certain provider and that never gets checked, and they are being treated with anti-inflammatory you know, medication, and they may have positive ANA or positive rheum uh, rheumatological test, but normal CRP. And this is the time to check SPEP. And, you know, if they have MGUS, gammopathy, 
You know, you, 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 you really don't need to treat them. You just need to refer them to hematology. You know? But, and, uh, you, please order in a, if there is a clinical suspicion of autoimmune disease, but if you want to screen somebody who has no symptoms whatsoever, no suggestive symptoms, it would not be a good idea. Uh, immune complex diseases, components of complement would be decreased, but just do not really think that they will be decreased all the time. And positive rheumatoid factor does not mean a disease all the time, but the levels are important. <coughs> when you have really high levels of rheumatoid factor, it's much more likely that something is going on. We used to be able to measure immune complexes. There's a C3D and a C1Q, and I don't think you can get them anymore. Is that because they weren't very good, or is that because they're not effective at screening people? I really never order those, and I just, I just don't have any information on that. I just don't know that. That answers my question. <laughs> what is the relationship of CCP to or arthritis? What the mechanistic relationship? Why that test? And why do you make why that test was situation? actually even yeah even even developed? Well, yeah, the why thing, was it even developed? Yeah. So the thing is that. All possible antigenic determinants were checked for antibody production. And one of those was actually uh, antibodies against citrulline. The reason is that... What's citrulline? Citrulline is, a, <coughs> is an, an amino acid. A, a natural one in human natural. biology? Mm -hmm. Yep, natural one. But, you know, and... Uh, but there are citrulline, uh, so, yeah, so residues in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the antigens. And certain positioning and certain changes cause some antigenic stimulation. And, and, and they develop, so the, the, in those patients, uh, there are frequently uh, developed antibodies against it. And actually, they can develop years and years and years and years before the actual clinical visit. <coughs> and uh, in, in, in people with seropositive rheumatoid arthritis, they, they are positive. Because one of the definitions of seropositivity now is positive CCP antibodies. And uh, the, the previous definition of seropositivity is a positive rheumatoid factor. Very frequently what I see that positive rheumatoid factor overlaps with positive CCP. So there are much more people who are double positive than, than just single positive. When you actually see clinical disease, erosive disease, those people are very likely to be both positive in rheumatoid factor and CCP, meaning that CCP really confirms that this is true seropositive rheumatoid arthritis. So that's, uh, uh, but it's much more specific than, 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 than rheumatoid factor, much more specific. <clears throat> All right, well, thank you again. Any other questions? For the, just one question for the future. Are, is there some new approach for diagnostics? Is it going to use proteomics or something to try to get more specificity, especially with the like DNA or rheumatoid factor? Any way to narrow the diagnosis? Or? So, uh, the, my answer would be I just don't know at the moment. We use lots of, you know, we, we use lots of tests for inflammation. There are other tests for inflammation to be used, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis. The thing is that, that rheumatoid arthritis is a very clinical diagnosis. It's very clinical. It's obvious from history and clinical exam when you, when you have symmetric swelling over a certain period of time 
and then you get positive antibodies, well, positive lab tests. But at the same time, if somebody has clinical exam and history suggestive of that, even if there is no lab test to confirm it, we would call this rheumatoid arthritis. It would be just, you know, it, 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 the, this clinical presentation would fall <coughs> into that category. Are there any new tests that are being developed? I'm not aware of that. But it's a pretty clinical diagnosis. I'm sure that this, we, I mean, essentially waste basket, you know, a term of zero negative rheumatoid arthritis will be more clarified and there will be other entities to, to discover and consider. But as of now, they are treated as such as rheumatoid arthritis. All right, thank you again. Oh, yeah. 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 Y